Okay, thanks, Jacob. Um, okay, so I want to talk about some explanatory questions related to the CPT and spin statistics theorem. Um, I'm going to use the blackboard, so it's probably good to blow me up to speaker view. Um, there's also a handout that's on the conference website, and Adam posted it in the chat as well, so you can follow along on that if you can't read the board. Um, okay, so here are the, the two theorems, the CPT and spin statistics theorems, stated rather breezily. Um, the first says the laws of any well-behaved relativistic quantum field theory are CPT invariant. That means they're invariant under a reflection that reverses the direction of time, reverses spatial parity, and conjugates all charges present in the theory. Um, the spin statistics theorem says in any well-behaved relativistic quantum field theory, the spin statistics connection holds. So particles with half integer spin have to obey fermionic statistics, and particles with integer spin have to obey bosonic statistics. Um, prima facie, these phenomena should have nothing to do with each other, but it turns out that when you actually spell out what counts as well behaved here, the theorems start to look really similar. And in certain versions of the CPT theorem, the spin statistic theorem pops up as a lemma. In some versions of the spin statistics theorem, the CPT theorem pops up as a lemma. So actually, you have reason to think that they're um, somehow tightly related. Um, from an interpretive angle, one thing that, of course, makes figuring out what's going on here physically difficult is that there's no universally agreed upon mathematical language for quantum field theory. And so when you look at these theorems in say Lagrangian field theory or S matrix theory or algebraic quantum field theory or Whiting field theory, these theorems look a little bit different. Um, nonetheless, one of the things that I want to kind of advocate for is that when you sort of uh, work your way through all of the mathematical junk, um, there is a kind of common physical core that seems to be at play in all different versions of these two theorems, right? So what do we mean by well behaved here? Um, one thing that pops up in all of these theorems is some notion of causality. And this is usually enforced by requiring um, observables at space-like separation to commute or fields at space-like separation to commute or anti-commute depending upon uh, their spin value. Um, it's usually interpreted as a kind of relativistic no signaling constraint, although there are debates about the physical motivation for these sorts of causality requirements. Um, the second main ingredient is uh, Lorenz invariance. Right, and here I mean invariance with respect to the connected component of the Lorenz group. Um, so not involving reflections and things like that. Uh, the third component is the spectrum condition, right, which requires that the generators of uh, energy momentum lie in the, uh, sorry, the, uh, the generators of translations, the energy momentum operators, uh, those lie in the forward light cone in momentum space. And this ensures that the spectrum, energy spectrum theory is bounded from below. It's an important stability requirement. Um, the last two ingredients, I think, are less well understood from a physical standpoint. Um, one of them is analyticity, which is sort of a big catch-all term. Um, pretty much every mathematically rigorous version of these theorems requires some pretty detailed analytic continuation arguments. And the source of that analyticity comes from different pieces and different frameworks. And figuring out exactly what's going on physically there, as well as which sorts of analyticity requirements we need to assume um, is a big kind of open gray area here. Um, the last piece, this goes back to the conversation that Jacob and I were just having, is some kind of requirement ruling out infinite spin representations. Um, so these are representations, uh, if you're doing uh, sort of a bigger style analysis of particle types in your theory. In the massless case, you can have uh, particles that transform with respect to an infinite dimensional representation of the Lorenz group. Um, in these cases, particle multiplex are going to be infinitely degenerate. Um, there are various arguments that these may be physically pathological, uh, although there's some evidence that maybe they're not quite as pathological as people think. But the issue here is that when you have infinite spin representations, you can actually construct counterexamples to both the spin statistics and the CPT theorem. And so again, like in every version of the theorem, there's usually some kind of technical 
constraint that rules those cases out. Um, okay, so this is a sort of common uh, sort of explanatory core that pops up in all of these different versions of the theorem. Um, the questions that I want to focus on today uh, are two. One, I want to ask, are these existing spin statistics and CPT theorems explanatory? Um, and if they are, what sorts of explanations are they providing? Um, there's a kind of orthodox physics answer, which is, uh, of course, the theorems are explanatory. And it seems to be some kind of non-causal explanation, right? Because these are explanations that trade in constraints on the laws of physics in some sense, right? They're not about causal chains in the world, at least directly. Um, moreover, the theorems seem to be special to relativistic quantum field theory. They seem to be telling us about sort of essential ingredients that we need to consistently combine relativity and quantum mechanics. Right, so that's the orthodox sort of answer. Um, that's, I'm going to try to defend the orthodox answer. Uh, that's come under uh, fire recently from a couple of different philosophers. Uh, so Hilary Greaves has written some really interesting work on the CPT theorem where she argues that uh, the CPT theorem is essentially a relativistic result. Quantum mechanical assumptions don't play a major explanatory role. Um, in a recent book, Jonathan Bain has questioned whether the current theorems are really explanatory. Um, and he's also raised some skeptical doubts about whether or not uh, Lorenz invariance and the spectrum condition are actually essential. We might be able to make do with weaker relativistic assumptions. Um, so here's the plan for the talk. Uh, that was the intro. Um, I'm going to give you a quick map of a sort of three-way debate between Bain, Greaves, and myself that's gone on for the past uh, few years. Um, then I want to focus on the reasons that Greaves and Bain have for being skeptical of the orthodox position. Um, I'm going to raise some objections to their arguments. And then at the end, I want to uh, loop back and think about the kind of non-causal explanation that uh, these theorems might provide. Because while there's sort of widespread agreement that if these things are explanatory, it's a kind of non-causal explanation. I think people have sort of, there's not widespread agreement on exactly what's, what sort of non-causal explanation is going on here. Okay. Uh, so our debate starts with Greaves. Um, back in her uh, doctoral dissertation and then a subsequent paper called uh, Towards a Geometrical Understanding of the CPT Theorem, uh, Greaves starts to sketch a explanation for CPT invariance in Lagrangian quantum field theory. Um, so she's working in something, in fact, most of the, most of the paper is written sort of from the standpoint of, of classical Lagrangian field theory. Um, the paper, the original paper uses the Feynman Stuckelberg picture of antimatter. Where an antiparticle is interpreted as just a regular particle traveling backwards in time. Um, and this has the following effect. Um, if you're worried about CPT invariance, um, if you take the Feynman picture on board, reversing the direction of time switches your particles and your antiparticles. And so the question, why is the theory CPT invariant, boils down to why is the theory PT invariant. Um, she then gives a kind of classical PT theorem, which attempts to explain why. And the kind of key thing going on here is a kind of non-causal explanation involving certain geometric constraints. Um, and these constraints uh, have to do with the various ways that certain kinds of classical Lagrangian theories can encode space-time orientation structures. Um, I'm not going to go into the details. Uh, I might t I'll say a little bit more about this in a bit. Um, I'm just trying to get a, kind of a large kind of picture of what's going on in, in the early Greaves paper. Um, so it's a kind of non-causal explanation involving geometric constraints on space-time orientations. Uh, the last thing to note about the Greaves paper is that when you run through this kind of explanation, 
most of the explanation is, is relying on uh, assumptions from special relativity. Uh, so quantum mechanical assumptions don't play a major role. And it's on the basis of this that she argues for the claim that actually the CPT theorem is essentially a relativistic result. Okay, so this is sort of the original, ah, I lost my uh, space there. Um, so this is the sort of original Greaves picture. Uh, later on, a couple of years later, she writes a detailed uh, technical paper with Chiruji Thomas that gives a more kind of detailed analysis of the same sort of setup. Um, the overall picture is essentially the same, but instead of the Feynman picture of antimatter, they replace that with uh, what you might call the textbook Lagrangian picture, where uh, particles and antiparticles are associated with um, positive and negative frequency subspaces of your uh, space of field configurations. Right? This is similar to the sort of the thing that Chip was talking about back in his talk. But the rest of the sort of story remains roughly the same. The story is about geometric constraints on space time orientation, and the argument is it's an essentially relativistic result. Um, so then, in my doctoral dissertation, I enter the fray. Um, I give some objections to Greaves, and I start to sort of develop a parallel story for what's going on in algebraic proofs of the CPT theorem. Um, instead of the Feynman picture or the Lagrangian picture of antimatter, um, this account uses the so-called DHRBF picture. Uh, this is a picture of antimatter that comes out of uh, Doppelker, Hogg, Roberts, Buchholz, Friedenhagen, and super selection theory, uh, which if you're familiar with algebraic quantum field theory, you'll know about. Um, if you're not, that will mean nothing. Um, the, the rough idea is that you start with a, a gauge invariant global algebra of observables, and then you focus on states that satisfy certain kinds of physical localization properties. There are states that look like the vacuum everywhere except for in some double cone or in some space-like cone. Uh, the idea is that unlike particles, charges can be well localized in either double cones or space-like cones. And then the crazy thing is from those inputs, you can actually reconstruct a gauge group and gives a sort of standard analysis of uh, charge structure in the theory, which is really cool. Um, so conjugate charge states are going to lie in uh, sort of conjugate super selection sectors, where those are characterized by having some net positive charge or a net negative charge boundary condition. Um, I'll say a little bit more. I think one of the things that I like about the algebraic picture better than Reeves's picture is that I think this is a much better view of antimatter than either the Feynman picture or the kind of textbook Lagrangian picture. There are similarities here. Um, the explanation that I try to give is also a kind of geometric constraint explanation. Um, and space-time orientation structures play a certain role, but there's actually another kind of orientation structure which appears in this story, which I think is really the key to unlocking physically what's going on in the algebraic CPT theorem, which is a kind of orientation structure on state space. Um, let's see how much time here, yeah. So I'm contractually obligated to write this equation in every talk that I give. Um, so if you take the standard non-commutative operator product, right, you're thinking of the C-star algebra or Hermitian operators on a, uh, on a Hilbert space, uh, you can break up the regular operator product into a Jordan product, which encodes all the spectral information about observables, and a Lie product that encodes how observables generate state space symmetries. And you can either choose the Lie product or its opposite product, and that corresponds to a decision about whether or not uh, the observable A generates clockwise or counterclockwise sort of rotations of state space, and minus A will do the opposite. So there's a kind of flexibility to choose an orientation structure here. Um, and the kind of explanation that I run is that the story of the CPT theorem, at least on the algebraic side, is the story of systematically reversing this orientation structure 
while preserving the form of the laws, uh, spectra of particles, and things like that. When all of that settles, um, you end up with an account of the CPT theory, which involves ingredients from both relativity and quantum mechanics. Um, one thing I should say here, I forgot to say this in the intro, I'm going to focus on CPT and spin statistics theorems in Minkowski spacetime. There's all sorts of interesting questions about what happens in curved spacetime, uh, but that's a whole other talk. So we're going to focus on special relativity here. Um, so meanwhile, Jonathan Bain uh, is working on a couple of papers on CPT and spin statistics theorems. These eventually get turned into uh, this book that he publishes in 2016. And he does lots of cool, interesting things in the book. Um, many of them I agree with. I'm going to focus on two things that I don't agree with. Uh, one thing that happens is he argues that the current CPT and spin statistics theorems are non-explanatory. Um, he raises some objections to the kind of explanation that Greaves gives and the kind of explanation that uh, I give. Um, and he agrees that the theorem involves in, uh, pieces from both relativity and quantum mechanics, but he has doubts about Lorenz invariance of the spectrum condition. Um, so that's essentially what the debate looks like. Um, later on, I write a review of uh, Bain's book where I raise some objections to these two arguments. Um, and so I'm going to go over some of those arguments here in the next couple of sections. Okay, so that's sort of the, uh, the current state of play. Okay, so let's take a look at some of the reasons why um, Bain and Greaves are skeptical of the orthodox view. Um, as I alluded in her early papers, uh, Greaves proves a classical PT theorem. Um, and the idea here is if you adopt the Feynman picture, the CPT puzzle reduces to a PT puzzle, and then you prove the following result. This is on a handout. Um, in classical Lagrangian field theories with local polynomial interactions and only tensor fields, um, Lorenz invariance entails PT invariance. So the idea is that there are, um, in a classical Lagrangian field theory like this, there are only sort of so many ways that you can encode up, say, a temporal orientation or a spatial orientation. You're always going to encode up additional, uh, additional structure. And that's going to then lead to the fact that Lorenz invariance entails PT invariance. Um, I don't want to dwell on this version of the theorem. I think there are a couple of major problems with it. One is it's got really limited scope. Uh, the theorem doesn't apply to theories with spinner fields. In fact, in their later work, Greaves and Thomas show there's a, there's a no-go result. There is no classical PT theorem for spinner fields. Um, it only applies to polynomial interactions. There are lots of interesting quantum field theories or in classical field theories with non-polynomial interactions. Um, the other thing is that I think the uh, DHR EF picture is a much better picture of antimatter than the Feynman picture. Um, for one thing, the Feynman picture relies on this notion of an, an orientation given to a particle world line. Um, there's broad consensus that insofar as we can talk sensibly about particles in quantum field theory, that particles are a kind of emergent structure. And so this is a sort of emergent picture of antimatter. Um, in contrast, the DHR picture applies at the fundamental level, and so it gives a kind of fundamental division between matter and antimatter. Uh, namely, field configurations uh, characterized by boundary conditions and conjugal superselection sectors. Um, the other thing is the Feynman picture seems to rule out a certain kind of interesting conceptual possibility, which is uh, field theories 
where you've got particles and antiparticles, but they have different masses and spins, right? If an antiparticle is just a particle traveling backwards in time, it's, it's sort of automatically conceptually guaranteed they have the same mass and spin. Um, but there are, are weird quantum field theories where that's not the case, where you've got um, particles and antiparticles with different masses and spins. They're not well-behaved relativistic quantum field theories, but they're otherwise decent looking quantum field theories. And it seems like that picture of antimatter is just gonna rule that out by field. Um, okay, so in, in her later work with Truji Thomas, rather than rely on the classical PT theorem, um, Greaves and Thomas prove a kind of unified quantum classical CPT theorem. Um, so this is also on the handout. Uh, so in both classical and quantum Lagrangian field theories, again with local polynomial interactions, and this time with either tensor or spinner fields, as long as those fields obey normal commutation, anti-commutation relations, um, then Lorenz invariance entails that CPT invariance is equivalent to this technical property called S-hermeticity. Um, the argument then is that the quantum version of the theorem, the classical version of the theorem have the same form. And so essentially, again, it's, it's, it's something common to both classical and quantum field theory. Uh, the problem I see with this kind of argument is that there are major disanalogies between the quantum and the classical version of the theorem. Um, in particular, the two versions of the theorem rely on different notions of s hermeticity Um, on the quantum side, the notion is related. So, so both have to do with the existence of some kind of involution operation on the theory state space. Um, on the quantum side, the notion of s hermeticity is related to the transformation from an operator to its adjoint, uh, the star operation in, uh, C, like in C star algebras. Um, but on the classical side, the relevant involution operation is defined with respect to charge conjugation. And so essentially what the classical CPT theorem says is that a classical field theory of the relevant type is CPT invariant if and only if it's C invariant, right? It has charge symmetry. But one thing that's interesting about the quantum theorem is we can have quantum field theories where charge symmetry is broken, but CPT symmetry must be maintained. And so there's some kind of interesting constraints or interaction between charge structure and space-time structure on the quantum side that seems to be missing in the classical version of the theorem. Um, the other objection that I want to highlight is that, again, I think the uh, DHRDF picture is a better picture of antimatter than the Lagrangian picture that they bring in. Right, the Lagrangian picture is no longer focused on uh, orientation of particle world lines, but it does require a splitting of the space of field configurations into a positive and negative frequency subspace. Um, you can do that in a Lorenz invariant way in free field theories or in the non-interacting limit of an interacting theory. But if you've got an interacting theory as a corollary of Hogg's theorem, you can't do that in a Lorenz invariant way. And so again, it seems like this is going to be a kind of emergent characterization of uh, matter and antimatter. Uh, whereas again, the DHRBF picture can be applied to say low dimensional interacting theories like Yukawa theory, and so it gives a more fundamental picture of antimatter. Um, I say this with some trepidation because I know David Wallace is lurking somewhere there. Um, okay, so those are some objections to Greaves and Greaves and Thomas. Uh, the argument is there's a kind of classical version of the CPT theorem. I don't think enough has been done to establish that the classical versions of these theorems have the same kind of scope uh, to be really parallel to the quantum version. Um, okay, so there's also uh, another kind of worry that comes from Jonathan Bain. Um, Bain looks at algebraic proofs of the CPT and spin statistics theorems. 
and argues that actually the algebraic proofs don't rely on Lorentz invariance in the spectrum condition. Um, I think in the interest of time, I'm going to gloss over this, but you guys can ask me about it. Um, essentially, I think that that relies on a sort of misinterpretation of what's going on in the algebraic theorems. Um, the kinds of technical conditions that he thinks are weaker, I think, are actually stronger. They're actually Lorentz invariance plus the spectrum condition plus additional analyticity. Um, and so I think that when you actually sort of, again, work through the mathematics, there's a, there's a very different picture going on there. Okay, so I want to push on to talk about some more philosophical topics related to explanation. Uh, Jacob, we started at 20 past, something like that, right? We started at 21. Okay, I'll try to keep this. I think I can finish in about 20 minutes here, which should be good. Yeah. Um, okay, so the other big question, right? So, so what did we just talk about? We talked about the extent to which these theorems require ingredients from both quantum mechanics and relativity, right? So my view is they're telling us something about the ingredients necessary to unify these theories that are sort of unique to uh, relativistic quantum field theory. Uh, the other way in which Bain has challenged the sort of orthodox view is he's argued that these theories actually might not be explanatory at all. Um, so before we dive into that bigger worry, I thought it would be useful to step back and think about some of the ways in which a physics theorem might fail to be fully explanatory. Um, right, it might be false. As I say, it might not accurately describe the real world. Um, and of course, there are obvious caveats that need to be made here for cases of approximation, abstraction, idealization, effective theories, all that jazz. Um, uh, a theorem might not be fully mathematically rigorous. Um, I don't want to go as far as to say that a non-rigorous sort of physicist theorem can't be explanatory. I think far from it. A lot of really interesting explanations come from these non-rigorous theorems. Um, nonetheless, lack of mathematical rigor, I think, can hide explanatory deficiencies in many cases. And there are also lots of good cases where searching for mathematical rigor, I think, gives us additional explanatory insight. Um, another thing, of course, is that the mathematics involved may lack clear physical interpretation. And this can happen both at the level of the inputs and the outputs, as well as in the middle, right? So one thing that happens in um, uh, some versions of, say, the algebraic CPT theorem is that you start with what look like physically motivated assumptions. At the end, you get something that looks like a physically reasonable statement. And in the middle is a whole bunch of math that has no clear physical interpretation, right? So if you want a, a theorem to be explanatory, you want the inputs to have clear physical interpretation, the outputs, as well as the sort of derivation in between. Um, the theorem might violate the sort of explanatory arrow, the arrow of explanatory dependence. Right, so think about like classic flagpole shadow type cases. There you've got a rigorous derivation, the inputs and the outputs in the middle are clear, physically speaking, but some, something in the derivation is backwards. It violates some kind of explanatory order of dependence. Um, that could be causal dependence. It could be some sort of metaphysical dependence or grounding. It could be some kind of numerological dependence. Um, just two more. Uh, an explanation or a theorem might not be joint carving. Right, so it might, for example, involve gauge degrees of freedom. Um, you eventually, you would want an explanation for the phenomena that doesn't mention the gauge degrees of freedom at all. Uh, and then last but not least, you might have an explanation that escapes all of these other features, but contains explanatorily irrelevant physical detail. Um, Right, so if I give some kind of explanation for my psychology that drives all the way down to the neurophysiological level, 
that may account for my behavior, but it won't account for my Martian friend who maybe has similar beliefs and desires, but a radically different uh, neurophysiological, neurophys whatever that word is, brain gunk. Um, right, so the, the point about six is optimal explanations are kind of a balancing act between sort of depth on the one hand and capturing the widest range of relevant phenomena. So this is sort of this balancing act between depth and breadth. And one way uh, a theorem can go wrong is by including sort of irrelevant explanatory detail and therefore having too narrow explanatory scope. Okay, so with this sort of in the background, um, what's Bain's concern? Right? Bain is worried that the current theorems don't actually explain. Um, I think Bain's concerns are most directly related to this, um, this, and this although I can see other places where they may forge connections. All right, he raises two kinds of skeptical concerns. Um, the first you might call the rival frameworks problem. The idea here is that when you look at uh, CPT and spin statistics theorems couched in Lagrangian field theory, algebraic field theory, Whiteman field theory, S-matrix theory, uh, you get what appear to be very different pictures about what the physical assumptions are, what the kind of order of explanation is, what the logic of the theorems are. And so if you're thinking, well, maybe all of these different approaches are kind of aiming at some kind of convergent explanation, it seems like the signs are all pointing in different directions. Um, the way he puts it at the beginning of the book is like this. That's not the right part. Nope, I thought I had flagged this, but apparently I didn't. Ah, here we go. Um, right, each of these different frameworks can be associated with a distinct way of understanding what a relativistic quantum field theory is about, i.e. what its basic objects are and what principles these basic objects are supposed to satisfy. Um, Right, so rather than seeing a kind of convergence towards a kind of common explanation, he sees the science pointing in different directions. Um, combined with this, there's something that he calls the existence problem. Um, which is a problem related to the extent to which we can be confident that certain models of quantum field theory actually exist. Um, the problem takes on sort of two different forms depending upon the framework you're working in. If you're working in axiomatic approaches like Whiteman theory or algebraic quantum field theory, the problem is that we don't yet know if the actual world, the standard model of particle physics or, or local uh, interacting gauge theories in, in four dimensions actually satisfy those axioms or actually models of that axiomatic framework. Um, so we don't know if the real world or even theories similar to the real world fit inside those axiomatic frameworks. Um, on the other hand, if you're working in Lagrangian field theory or S-matrix theory, uh, you've got a sort of different criteria for what counts as existence according to Bain, right? What you want is some kind of mathematical construction that satisfies some sort of constraints, renormalizability, Borel sum ability, uh, something like that. And uh, his thought then is actually that well, we can say, it's actually a little unclear. Sometimes he seems to think that the, it's, we're not yet at the point where we can say that, say, the standard model actually exists according to those criteria. And other times he seems to say that the problem is really that we don't yet know if the way we have of characterizing, say, the standard model captures uh, kind of what it is to be a relativistic quantum field. Um, Right, uh, so what to say in the face of these problems? Um, so I think that, first of all, as far as the rival frameworks problem goes, I think when you look at different proofs of the CPT and spin statistics theorems, um, I mean, the very, very beginning I said there's a kind of common explanatory core. And I think one place where Bain gets hung up is I think he sort of, he misses that uh, common core among all the details. So in particular, he, emphasizes the fact that Lorenzen variance of the spectrum condition aren't essential to the algebraic proof, 
but actually I think those are quite um, central to the, sort of the correct logic of those theorems. Um, the other thing to say about the rival frameworks problem is that, uh, right, just because two different frameworks start from different mathematical points, right, they have different mathematical starting points, right, that doesn't necessarily mean they disagree about what sorts of structures are fundamental. Um, so, for example, in Whiteman theory, you start with field operators, but you don't actually, in the end, think those things directly latch onto reality, right? You have to quotient out by some gauge group. Um, in, uh, when, when, in, if you look at like Weinberg's presentation, sort of S matrix driven presentation of quantum field theory in his intro textbooks, certain general constraints on the S matrix, cluster decomposition, um, crossing symmetry, things like that, play a kind of critical role in defining what it is to be a relativistic quantum field theory. Nonetheless, he thinks that actually those features of a field theory can be derived and explained in terms of what's fundamental, namely some kind of field theoretic structure at the bottom. Um, so the first thing to know is just because two different frameworks start from different mathematical points doesn't mean they actually disagree about what's fundamental, right? That requires quite a bit of interpretive work. Um, the second thing to say is, it's true at present, these frameworks don't have some nice sort of nested set of models, right? Um, there are models of one theory that don't fit nicely into the other and vice versa. Um, and I think the question here is, is that really a signal of deep conceptual disagreements about what it is to be a relativistic quantum field theory? Or is that the result of frameworks that make certain kinds of expedient mathematical or technical assumptions, either to simplify calculations or to capture a certain family of nice quantum field theories. Um, so I think that Bain and I just have a kind of different viewpoint on how much convergence there is in current proofs of the CPT and spin statistics theorem, and exactly how much disagreement there is between these different frameworks and what's, um, what to make of the sort of leftover disagreement. I also think that I'm much more optimistic about the existence problem. I really think that what it boils down to is the question, do the axiomatic approaches um, could they possibly capture something like the standard model? Um, whereas for the pragmatic approaches for these, for things like Lagrangian and S-matrix theory, the question is, when you look at proofs of the CPT theorem and those uh, frameworks, do those theorems plausibly capture what it is that all relativistic quantum field theories with these spin statistics and CPT properties have in common? Um, so I think that for Lagrangian and S-matrix theory, the question is sort of essentially whether or not those explanations include irrelevant physical detail. Whereas for say algebraic and Whiteman field theory, the question is the first thing, right? Are they, do they actually adequately describe the real world? Um, Bain also talks about how the uh, sort of the order of derivation in different theorems goes in different directions, which means they, they, they all can't be providing the right explanation because the explanatory error will be going in different directions. Um, I think that that can be assuaged to some extent by realizing, well, if, if the frameworks aren't really disagreeing about what fundamentally is a relativistic quantum field theory, um, they have different mathematical starting points, they have different sort of sets of models because they're trying to capture different uh, sort of subgroups of theories, then of course you're going to have different arrows of mathematical derivation, right? Because what you can derive from sort of narrower mathematical assumptions will be different from what you can derive from wider mathematical assumptions. Um, there is a big interesting open question here, which is sort of which comes first, the spin statistics theorem or the CPT theorem? Um, that I think is a really good explanatory question that uh, interpreters of quantum field theory should try to suss out. And a lot I think rides on it in this case. Um, so I think that I'm, I'm more optimistic than Bain. I think that uh, the explanation for CPT invariance and the spin statistics connection is probably buried in the current theorems that we have. I think we have good reason to think that those theorems are sort of converging on a kind of common explanation. Um, that being said, I don't think the theorems by themselves explain, right? The theorems have to be interpreted. And a lot of that interpretive work, interpretive work is sort of going through things like one through six and trying to figure out, you know, where exactly are the joints? What's the order of explanation here? Um, which bits of my theory describe reality directly and which bits are just mathematically expedient? Um, okay, so let me wrap up in the last eight minutes or so. 
Um, So basically what I want to do here is just connect these sorts of debates to two recent ideas in the philosophical literature on non-causal explanation. Um, one of those ideas comes from uh, Jim Woodward, W questions. Um, Woodward has given a very influential account of causal explanation that relies on the notion of a causal intervention. Right, so on Woodward's account, um, explanation aims to answer certain kinds of counterfactual questions, things that he calls what if things had been different questions, or W questions for short, um, that concern a certain sort of process, namely taking a causal model, surgically intervening and changing the value of some variables in your causal model, and then tracing out what else changes. That's the kind of picture of causal explanation that Woodward provides. Um, now, in that picture, it's really critical for Woodward, at least, that the interventions in question be causal processes. That's how he's able to get around certain kinds of skeptical problems like explanatory symmetry, flagpole shadow cases, etc. Um, but one thing that other philosophers have been thinking about recently is whether or not you can sort of extract from Woodward's causal story a kind of non-causal variant. Um, and so these center on the idea of a non-causal intervention. Right, so the idea here is that when we think about something like the CPT theorem, one of the games that mathematical physicists and philosophers of physics and physicists themselves play is taking some general constraint and fiddling with some of the details, changing the value of some parameter, um, moving from one kind of constraint to a more general constraint. And what they're doing there is not causally manipulating some system, right? They're conceptually or mathematically fiddling with some variable. Um, a lot of what Woodward says about interventions seems like it can be carried over to these sorts of non-causal interventions. Uh, the big question is whether or not you can do all the work that you want with the notion of a non-causal intervention. And one of the big worries is the problem of explanatory asymmetry. Um, uh, Rutlinger has a kind of recent paper uh, where he talks about a kind of unified theory of explanation in terms of answering W questions, which can include via causal or non-causal interventions. Um, it's a really cool paper, but one of the things, one of the bullets that you have to bite is you have to give up on sort of certain cases of explanatory asymmetry. Uh, so when you're doing these non-causal interventions, the upshot is you may not have a clear arrow of explanation. The explanation can go both directions as it were. And some people have thought that's too big of a bullet to bite. Um, I'll mention the second trend in, in a bit, but one observation that I have is that actually this, this task of interpreting the CPT and spin statistics theorem, I think, especially in light of the kinds of interpretive questions that I was raising in my back and forth with Bain, is gonna rely on answering a whole bunch of non-causal, what if things had been different questions, right? What if I take my axioms for quantum field theory and change from Lorentz invariance to some subgroup of Lorentz invariance, rotational invariance, say, or what happens if I um, move from a quantum field theory to a classical field theory that has some kind of particle antiparticle structure. Um, and I think that this is a really good test case for sort of exploring that idea of explanation via answering non-causal, what if things had been different questions. Um, I do think though we can say a bit more about this explanatory dependence problem, the explanatory asymmetry problem. Um, and the thing that I wanna sort of draw attention to is Mark Lang's work on metal laws. Um, right, so a metal law is supposed to be like a law of nature, whatever you think those things are, except for they're more general. And rather than constraining things in the world, they actually constrain laws themselves. Right, they're laws about laws. They're metaphysically contingent. There could be different metal laws, um, but they're constraints on the laws of nature. And 
I think that when you look at the CPT and statistics theorem, um, a bunch of the assumptions that are in there jump out as good candidates for meta laws, right? So the causality requirements, I think, could plausibly be construed as meta laws in Lang's sense. Um, Lorenz invariance, spectrum condition, all look to me at least like good candidates for meta laws. Um, for Lang, the kind of litmus test for are you a meta law is when you consider counternomics, right? Counterfactuals about if the laws were different, do you hold fixed certain claims? And when the claims that you hold fixed, the, the, the thought is are the meta laws. So as we're playing this game of fiddling around with, you know, different Lagrangians, we hold fixed that the theories are Lorenz invariant, but we hold fixed that uh, they obey certain kinds of causality constraints. So I think that looks like a kind of good feature of of Lang's approach. Um, Lang has a particular view about what laws and meta laws are from a metaphysical standpoint. I don't think you have to go in for all that. Um, I do think that any account of laws of nature should grapple with the question of meta laws. Are there meta laws? If so, how, are they the same thing as laws? Um, there's an interesting side question, which we can talk about later, which is if you're a Humean about laws, can you make sense of meta laws? Um, I'm not sure that you can. So this might require kind of non Humeanism about laws and meta laws. Uh, but at the end of the day, what you have is a kind of tower of constraints, right? At the bottom, you've got laws. Those are constrained by meta laws. Meta laws are constrained perhaps by other meta laws. Um, eventually, you get to the level of, say, metaphysical constraints. or conceptual constraints, mathematical constraints. Um, and so the idea that comes out of Lang's work on meta laws is that just as you can appeal to laws as constraints on how things are on the ground, you can appeal to various sort of constraint stages of this hierarchy to explain things lower down in the hierarchy. And so why I think this is interesting is that one way of pitching what's going on in the CPT and spin statistics theorem is a sort of constraint explanation, a kind of geometric constraint explanation um, that sits way up here at the kind of mathematical or conceptual level. Um, but if some of these big assumptions like uh, spectrum condition, Lorenz invariance, causality are actually meta laws, then I think you have a sort of more physically rich explanation that sits at least in part at this sort of lower level. Uh, which I think would be interesting to suss out. Right, there are, of course, other features of the theorem that uh, it's not at all obvious that they're metalaws, the analyticity constraints, um, uh, the no, uh, no infinite spin representations. Um, my hope, the conjecture is, that you can actually derive those rather technical, messy looking properties from other things that look much more natural, much more physically motivated, and could be candidates for meta laws. Uh, so the kinds of conditions I have in mind here are thermodynamic conditions like the split property or modular nuclearity that uh, put bounds on sort of how many local degrees of freedom there are in a relativistic quantum field theory. Um, so I think the sort of the door is open for more interesting interpretive work. Um, I think it would be interesting to suss out whether or not the sort of ingredients in the CPT and spin statistics theorems uh, could be construed as meta laws. Um, and uh, I think that could give us a kind of interesting test case to explore for uh, a kind of deep example of non causal explanation. Thanks. Isaac, you had a question? Oh, yeah. Um... So I wanted to, so thanks, that was super interesting. Uh, I'm very sympathetic uh, to your side in this debate. Um, so I wanted to say something that I think will help bolster um, or just lend further support to one of the lines you were taking. Um, this, it's about the stuff about asymmetry. So I don't think, uh, I don't really think that a fan of interventionist explanation needs to get too worried about uh, violating asymmetry in cases where there's no, you know, corresponding causal physical intervention, um, because you're dealing with non-causal relationships. Um, so the reason is basically because, uh, so, so let's talk about the flagpole case. So in the flagpole case, um, the reason why 
uh, Woodward's account of explanation uh, captures the, the asymmetry that you want is just because, uh, number one, Woodward endorses a particular model of the situation, a particular formal model. And number two, that formal model has the property that there's no uh, directed explanation, uh, uh, sorry, no directed equation from the shadow variable to the height variable. Yeah. Uh, there just is no such equation in the model. You could add an equation to the model. If you did that, you would get a, a kind of, I mean, let's just call it counterfactual, it would be super bizarre, but it'd be like a counterfactual dependency uh, of the sort that would violate asymmetry. Um, but to that, someone who's a fan of Woodward would just say, you're, you're working with the wrong formal model. The right formal model just has the equation that, uh, you know, goes one direction, not the other. And I think when it comes to uh, like mathematical explanations that you're trying to model using the interventionist framework, the exact same sort of stuff is going to apply. So if you think in, in the case of the CPT theorems or the statistics theorems that the explanation goes in one direction, uh, there's a straightforward way to claim that. You claim that by saying, here's the interventionist model. It's got all these variables representing different like mathematical facts and physics facts and so on. Uh, here's the directed equation uh, that take you know the input variables and use those to determine the values of the output variables, and then there is just no equation going the other way in the right model for the for the case of explanation that we're trying to capture using this interventionist framework. Of course, there will be equations and de like mathematical dependencies going the other way that you could stick into the what you're calling the right model, but you would but like the person taking your position would just say that that just isn't the right model and it's not the right model because it's getting the the uh uh symmetry and asymmetry facts wrong just like you could you could take woodward's model of the flagpole case stick in an extra equation that would that would violate asymmetry but then woodward would just say you've got the wrong model yeah good so um one of the things that i didn't i sort of didn't get to at the end of the handout um Right, so in, in these sorts of debates about what's the right causal model, there are debates about do the models capture the right difference makers, the right causal difference makers. And one thing that I think pops up a lot in these, when you start to look at non-causal cases that are like this, is that there's sort of two games you can play. You can look for what I think are the physical difference makers, and you might look for the mathematical difference makers. And I think those can come apart and we have to be worried, about, like we have to be aware of that. Think about mathematical difference makers. You're typically looking for you know, the most mathematically general version of some theorem. So you say, well, if, if, a, if, a, you know, if a quantum field theory has these mathematical properties, then that's just the situation where it's got CPT invariance. But those mathematical properties may not have a nice natural physical interpretation. They might not carve out a nice natural class of physical models. Meanwhile, there's a stronger mathematical requirement that is plausibly something like a metal and you might think that's the physical difference maker because that's what tells me what all relativistic quantum field theories have in common. Um, so I think as interpreters, we have to be careful of when we're using mathematical structure to represent physical structure in some sense, what's the kind of relevant mathematical difference makers versus what's the relevant physical difference makers. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's right. Uh, yeah, I, I just wanted to point out that there's when you start trying to model the explanatory structures of these cases, you're, you're making commitments of exactly the sort you were just saying. Like this class of mathematical things, though it derives the relevant result, isn't really the real explainer. This other more natural class is. Yeah, good. I also think, you know, one thing that's weird about the Woodward account, of course, is that it's a non-reductive account of causation. It analyzes causation in terms of other kinds of causal processes. Um, and uh, you know, one question you could give is, well, could you give a kind of reductive story that's consistent with that kind of explanatory story? And you know, my two cents are that I think a lot of causal claims bottom out in nomological claims. And some of the really tortured stuff that Woodward says about, well, we need metaphysically impossible causal interventions in order to make sense of certain really prosaic physical explanations, like what if the moon were in a different position? I think there's a very natural thing to say there, which is that the reason we have a good grip on what's going on is because we understand the laws and the mobilological constraints are really clear and we can easily fiddle with, with variables and in, in that perspective viewed, viewed as what's constrained by the laws and then answer those questions in a much more direct way. Yeah. David. Um, Daniel Reed. Yeah, um, thanks. I, I wanted to 
follow up one of one potential advantage of the Lagrangian style approach that um that, that Greaves and, and and Thomas play with that, that I, th I think wasn't in the taxonomy, although it's it's related to your concerns about falseness. Um, so one way you might have about CPT is uh, we've got no particular reason to think that the world is field theoretic on arbitrary short scales. Um, we've got extremely strong reason to think that in particular it's not the standard model on arbitrarily small short scales. Um, so we might be worried like why, given these things, um, why would we be confident that um, anything like this really held so robustly. We might, we might even, if we're feeling radical, be, be worried about how confident we are the world will be in variant and arbitrary short scales. Um, what we do have is an effective field theory framework. We do have the idea that under really robust circumstances, you can integrate out the degrees of freedom you don't have access to and get a situation where on a certain scale, um, the theory is described by such and such um, path integral with, determined by such and such action. Um, and from that effective field theory viewpoint, um, then we seem to have quite a good understanding of what's going on in CPT and spin statistics coming from the Greaves Thomas star version of the CPT of, of CPT theorem, which is to say, insofar as the correct effective field theory is a Lorentz covariant, um, uh, is governed by Lorentz covariant action, then it will be the case that it's CPT, that, 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 that it's CPT invariant. Um, and then we can just be neutral as to what would happen if at some shorter scales we have a failure of the Lorentz covariance or a failure of the field theoretic description entirely, that doesn't matter. Um, we're just telling you something about what's going on at the scales um, at which this description is valid. Um, and but maybe, maybe let me just leave it there rather than um, going into further epicycles. I mean, what's your feeling about that sort of defense of the advantage of the Lagrangian approach? Yeah, good. So, so one thing, I, I mean, I've said this elsewhere, but I'll say it again. Um, I've sort of focused on the difference between these different frameworks, Lagrangian, S-matrix, algebraic, Whiteman. Um, I think that that kind of division is largely orthogonal to exact field theories or effective field theories. And uh, you know, the algebraic approach, if it can't account for effective field theories, is not a good account of quantum field theories, right? Part yeah. of the data is to account for what is an effective field theory. Um, so yeah, so I, I agree that if we think that um, one part of the explanatory puzzle that I didn't touch on at all here is if we think the world is only an effective field theory, but it has these properties, yeah. how does that explanation work? Especially because there are reasons to think that the, at least the mathematically rigorous versions of the CPT and spin statistics theorem really do rely on sharp microcausality all the way down and um, things that look like would only you know, all these analytic continuation arguments, right? That's, that's looking like it relies on a kind of continuum picture of space time. Um, so yeah, so I think there's, there's, there's a big sort of explanatory gap question, which is if all you have is an effective theory, but you've got a good theorem for um, an exact quantum field theory, how do you bridge that gap? So that's, the, okay, there was, there was a step there I wasn't sure about. I mean, uh, you know, in, insofar as I can have a proof that says, input a Lagrangian with such and such properties, um, output the fact that it's particle phenomenology or whatever phenomenology will look CPT invariant or, spin or the base spin statistics or whatever. I mean, that, that, that relies on mathematical properties of that Lagrangian, but it's not clear that there's any work being done by physical assumptions about EG analysticity all the way down. I mean, the, the Lagrangian obeys these exact results, um, but um, you know, the, the give is, is between uh, the Lagrangian and, and, and the domain of applicability. Now I can see there's potentially a, a problem in, in terms of some of your concerns about explanation because you might think that what's doing the work is um, a mathematical details that don't have a, a kind of physical interpretation very directly. Uh, and I can see the force of that to some extent, but in terms of like the sort of prior question, if you like, about if we want to see what, why, I mean, if we want to understand why it is that the physics we actually observe is CPT invariant or a base spin statistics, that doesn't seem, seem, or seems much of a problem. Yeah, so I, I, I see Dave has a hand up here. I think I might want to tag team to him on this because one, one other issue that I didn't mention about the Greaves and um, Thomas paper is they've got this notion of a formal field theory. It's working broadly within the Lagrangian perspective, but it's not clear to me how effective that framework is. Right? So they're relying on all sorts of assumptions like, 
field commutivity, anti-commutivity, and space-like separation. And it's not clear to me that their theorem goes through if you replace that with an effective cutoff version or not. And I think this is the point that, that Dave, you've made this point before, right? Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, yeah, this is exactly what I was gonna say is, um, you know, the, uh, the Greaves-Thomas CPT theorem assumes Lorentz covariance at all scales. And uh, like, I, I see no reason to assume that it would go through if it didn't, so. Um, yeah, I, I don't see a difference here. And, and this, this, I think, underscores what Noel is just saying, which is that, um, you know, this isn't really an algebraic versus Lagrangian thing. This is a, a thing about, do these things that go through uh, assuming exact Lorentz covariance apply to effective field theories? And I mean, presumably they, it would be kind of insane if they didn't, but, you know, we don't, we don't have a mathematical proof that they, that they do go through. And we don't in the uh, uh, algebraic uh, uh, arena and the Greaves-Thomas theory, theorem doesn't give us one, uh, that's an alternative. So, you know, it's, I, I just don't think it changes anything. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm not sure I'm convinced, but I'm, that might just be because the, the, the issue of how much control we have over or how much understanding we currently have about the free to effective move. Um, and then maybe that's a debate about how well that's understood in the algebraic framework at the moment and to some extent comes to those, some of those broader issues about how well it applies to these theories. Okay, but that's helpful anyway, that clarifies what's going on. Just one other quick thing I'll say on that point. Um, the way that Bain pitches the explanatory question is, do these theorems explain the real world? And I actually think that that's one interesting explanatory question and this question about effective field theories is certainly relevant there. But another thing, another kind of way to pitch the explanatory question is on the orthodox view, CPT invariance and spin statistics uh, connection seems to be something that we need to have a consistent relativistic quantum theory. And so if you're interested in, you know, could I have a, a, a world that's relativistic and quantum all the way down? What's required of a theory like that? And then it seems like the exact, uh, you know, the Whiteman algebraic proofs would be important to understand that kind of. Well, yeah, I mean, I guess that then turns on broader questions of how we think about philosophy of Q of T. I mean, Insofar as what you know, insofar as one's skeptical that QFT can apply all the way down because of the lessons we get from normalization, that's obviously going to have less bite. But you know, that's a <laughs> that's a that's a, that's a long-standing debate. <laughs> okay, thanks. That's really helpful. I have a question that, that's that's somewhat related. Um, so, does anyone have a question before me? I'm happy to to cede my time. I think does Isaac have a hand up? But Isaac, was that up? Was your hand up from before? Yeah. Sorry, I can't figure out how to get rid of it. Okay. 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 Yes, yeah, so I had a question that, that's that's somewhat related. Um, the CPT theorem and the spin statistics theorem are both uh, statements about discrete facts, right? Like it, there's a CPT transformation, which is a discrete transformation that is or is not, you know, a, 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 a symmetry. Um, and and spin statistics is in some sense even more like discrete in the sense that you you either have you know bosonic statistics or fermionic statistics, nothing in between. At least with CPT, you could imagine you know, the a CPT symmetry being approximate, like you can imagine some, you know, limiting approximation, whereas spin statistics is a little bit difficult to, to think of in those terms. Um, so this is connected to David, uh, David Wallace's question about uh, how to think about this in terms of effective field theory. Mm -hmm. um, if you imagine that you have an effective field theory with a cutoff um, that through some clever means, you change field variables, you, you do some tricks, you you know, upgrade your theory, you change degrees of freedom, you're able to raise that cutoff. You can just keep raising it, raising it, raising it. Um, you could imagine some, you know, limiting sequence of field theories with arbitrarily high cutoffs where the cutoff is never at infinity. You never have exactly, you know, uh, you never have exact microcausality conditions, you never have exact, you know, uh, uh, you know um, you, 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 the, the energies never go all the way to infinity. Um, and to me, it strikes me as something odd that a theorem like Spinsic's theorem could be valid when the cutoff is literally infinite, but there is no limiting process by which, like if, it's, if it fails literally at every single step in that sequence and only holds in the infinite limit, that strikes me as pathological. Most um, you know, physics theorems, folk theorems in physics, the sort of non-rigorous theorems, they have give. Right, uh, and and that seems like it doesn't have given that that strikes me as problematic from an explanatory point of view. Yeah, yeah. One one thing, one person to ask about this would be John Bain because one of the things that he does in this book is talk a lot about um, not that limit, but how you get from spin statistics and QFT to non-relativistic spin statistics. And so he's got interesting views about how to think about that limit that 
I think could potentially be applied here as well. Um, Jacob, I can think of, well, this is kind of still pretty abstract, so you can question the physicality, but uh, when I was looking into the Kerr CFT correspondence a while back, one of the things that emerged was that if you try to approach extremal black holes, uh, vers like ro extremal rotating black holes versus just have an exact extremal rotating black hole, it has like weird implicate, like that limit uh, doesn't give you back like the sort of stuff that Andy Strominger and, and so on are working on. So that's maybe an example of a case where you think you're taking perfectly nice, uh, you know, limiting, you know, physical limits to some something, but then there's like this weird branching that occurs. Um, I don't know. So it can happen. Were there other questions for Noel? Otherwise, we can. I don't know. David has a question. Oh, David. Well, you can open up. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a little tangential. I was just, just wondering about the, um, the, the, the point about antimatter um, uh, and the advantages of the, um, the, the, the uh, do you want to say DHR? How you describing it? Um, so so I, you know, I, I can certainly see, certainly see the point about, about um, some infelicity specifically of Feynman's way of describing it, but I'm wondering why, in your view, it's a disadvantage for an approach to antimatter to only describe particulate antimatter. And after all, our, our empirical reason for taking antimatter seriously is entirely, I, I take it, about the, um, about the existence of antiparticles. It's the experimental discovery of antiparticles and the realization that you, know, you get antiparticles out in such, such a way. It sort of feels like, as far as, far as the existence of non-particular forms of antimatter are concerned, it sort of feels like spoils the victor. I mean, if we had a non-particular sort of antimatter out there that we needed to account for empirically, of course, it'd be an enormous advantage. Um, but for, abs absent that, it's not quite so obvious in what the um, dialectical force is. Uh, good, so I, I would point to two things. One is this game of the orthodox view is any well-behaved, suitably, you know, suitably characterized, well-behaved quantum field theory should obey this CPT symmetry. And the thought is that actually you've got good examples of quantum field theories that don't have a clear emergent particle structure, but they're otherwise well behaved and they satisfy these more general versions of the theorem. And so if you're looking for what is the explanation for this, it seems to sit at this bigger level of uh, sort of wider range of modal scope. Okay. That's one, one issue. All right. The other issue is, um, yeah, it's not related to whether it's emergent or fundamental. It's a question of like where there's conceptual space. Yeah. And um, the, the thing that seems to be interesting about, one of the things that's weird about the CPT theorem is it seems like there's got to be this necessary connection between spatiotemporal structure and charge structure, which prima facie is really weird. And it gets even weirder when you think about um, like the Coleman Mandula theorem, right? Um, and so I think that trying to explain what's going on there is something about charge and spatiotemporal orientation structure. And I think that, you know, one of the problems with the Feynman view is that the, you, you sort of like, and, and I think this carries over to the Lagrangian view to an extent, is that there's a feature of quantum field theories, which is there's always this nice positive negative frequency symmetry going on. And the question is, why does there have to be that symmetry answer something about this connection between charge structure and space-time orientation, not vice versa? Oh, okay, but I mean, I mean, this may betray the fact that I didn't keep up carefully enough with the, um, the later Grease and Thomas paper, but I, this is something Hillary and I talked about a lot when she was in Oxford working on this, or I was in Oxford working on this. Um, and as I recall, the answer that, that she had, which was fairly, fairly similar to the answer I had in my stuff in antimatter, was, was somewhat deflationary about this. So um, the, the content, as, as she was expressing it then, and as I was expressing it, the content of the CPT theorem was that there exists, a, for any quantum field theory, that there exists a parity time symmetry. Now, for, so, so to, be, to be a parity symmetry is for the, for the transform field at, at um, xt to depend on the untransformed field at minus xt and similarly for, the, um, for, for a time symmetry. Uh, now, whether, once you've got a symmetry that's a, par that's a parity time symmetry, um, do you call that symmetry CPT or PT? Now, on 
Hillary's an analysis and, and as far as I can recall of mine, that answer then comes down to what the, what the transformation does to the um, to the part to the to the part and antiparticle sectors and how it interacts with charge. But that's not inherent to the way the proof goes particularly, and it's not inherent to and, and to some extent it's conventional. I mean, if I uh, at least as I read field theory, it's sort of up to me. What, once, what, you know, it's, it's, it's a non-conventional matter whether a given symmetry is a parity symmetry or a time symmetry, but it's a conventional matter which of the various parity or time symmetries counts as P or T or CP or whatever. Um, that's up to me. Um, and so it's, some, it's somewhat conventional that I want to say a par um, the time reversal symmetry does not transfer um, antimatter, does not, does not invert the antimatter and matter sectors. Um, now, that doesn't necessarily need to commit you to the Feynman position here. It's just a matter of, um, you know, if I've, got, if I've got a certain transformation and it in fact does permute the matter and antimatter sectors, do I want to call that the T-symmetry or the CT-symmetry? Um, I mean, perhaps again, perhaps I'll just leave it there. I mean, that, that, that sort of somewhat deflation we take on what the connection is between the charge and the space-time symmetries I, I took as being, at least in Hillary's original paper, about one, one of the sort of important take-ends from it. Yeah, good. So, so my impression is, that flexibility exists on the classical side, right? So there's, there's a paper by, oh, um, like, it's like an old, it's like a fight of paper that talks about CPT symmetry and CPT violation in classical field theories. And one of the things, one of the points they make is exactly this, which is to call something a PT or a CPT transformation is somewhat conventional. Um, and so they've got these models that you could describe as CPT violating, or you could describe it as PT violating, depending upon how you yeah. put this. My sense is you don't have that flexibility on the quantum side. And that's one of the things that distinguishes the quantum side from the classical side. So I think my suspicion is that Hillary coming at this from a kind of classical field theory perspective sees that flexibility yeah. and then reads it into the quantum theory. I don't think it's there on the quantum side. But that's okay, kind of a conjecture that I got to figure out. I mean, I take it that can't be a, a systematic claim that there isn't some level of this flexibility and redefinition. And, and we know for something like CP symmetry, um, when we talk about is there CP violation in various sectors, one of the things you have to check for is whether you can get around it just by redefining which transformation you want to call the CP transformation. Yeah. And, th and that very does seem to have the character of saying, like, is there a symmetry such that it fits the conditions for something to be a CP symmetry. But I take the point that doesn't in itself imply that that works for all of these sort of transformations. Okay, that's, that's that I need to look at more carefully. Ben, are you, uh, Feinstein, are you listening? I'm here. So what I really want to know to answer this question, and I'm hoping that you can figure this out for me at some point, is I think what's going on is that when you, you've got this Lie product in, um, non-commutative C star algebras. You use that Lie product to encode the generating relation between observables and space-time symmetries and observables and internal gauge symmetries. Essentially what's going on in the algebraic CPT theorem is you can show that you can systematically reverse that and that preserves everything. And so there's certain kinds of limits on how you can use that orientation structure, that Lie product to encode stuff. I suspect there's greater flexibility on the classical side which is going to be some story about how you can code stuff up in um, classical Lee Jordan algebras, right? So. That's a suspicion. And there are, there's, there's some kind of interesting partial results here, right? Um, uh, the, oh, shit, what was it? Um, Right, so in a classical Lee Jordan algebra, right, there's this associator relation, which if I transform a state, tells me does it change spectral properties, the extent to which the Jordan project is, fails to be associative. And in the classical case, I can transform states without affecting spectral properties. Whereas in the quantum case, if I transform states, that actually can affect the spectral properties. Um, and that's re essentially related to the Heisenberg uncertainty relations. So I suspect that there's something, there's definitely a sense in which a quantum Lee Jordan algebra has sort of more constraints than a classical Lee Jordan algebra. And I suspect that that's critical to how the story is going to work out. So, so now I'm finding myself wondering how, on, on the, on the basis of what we just talked about, how the, um, 
uh, the Greaves Thomas um, paper actually produces its result. I mean, uh, so you know, it, it, presumably it, it either does or it doesn't need to talk explicitly about the particle spectrum of the theory in proving the result. Um, if, it does, if, it, if it does, then I agree that's a really substantial restriction. But if it does, I also don't see how it could be a unified quantum classical um, account. So um, yeah, this comes to the details of it. I haven't looked at it carefully enough. Yes, I mean, I think the, the, for me, the limitation of the Greaves-Thomas theorem is that their classical CPT theorem essentially says the theory is CPT invariant if and only if it's C invariant. And so it builds in a kind of particle-antiparticle symmetry as, if, as, as by fiat, which I don't think needs to be there. So hang on, so it explicitly doesn't apply to C non invariant um, sectors of the standard model? No, it does not. Okay. That's so, the biggest analogy between the two theorems. So, I mean, you, you've, you've been making a kind of relatively subtle case as to why the alternative approach you like is, is, is better. If that's the case, why isn't that a screamingly strong, strong objection? No, I think it's screamingly strong, but I'm just being understated. Yeah. I mean, yeah, that, that, I mean, that, that I stated seems to me to close the debate. If you really want to say, look, um, uh, there are fields in nature to which these results just flatly don't apply, then that seems to cut through all of the explanatory um, concern about is this a better explanation. Okay, so sorry, so one quick thing though, their, their, their quantum CPT theorem doesn't have that feature. Ah, okay, right. Good. So, so, the, so the point is there's a disanalogy right. between the classical so. theorem and the quantum theorem, not that their quantum theorem is invalid. Sorry. Okay, right, yeah. And yeah, that would be more screaming than, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I think we should open debate more broadly to other stuff too. I know there are people with lingering questions. Yeah, I, I'm gonna end the recording now because I guess this is the end of Noel's talk, right? And then this is just sort of general questions. So I'm gonna stop the recording and um,